Oh, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that song. All right. Hey, welcome, guys. Welcome to New Life Christian Church. So glad you're here today. Hey, I want, before we go to the Word, I, I want to say a quick word about our Charlie Brown live production that happened on Wednesday. We've been talking about so much. Um, we had a great turnout. I don't know how many of you were there or not, but our best guess is somewhere north of 1,500 people showed up for this event. Uh, might even have crossed 2,000. We're not sure, but somewhere in that range. And so I want to thank all of you who prayed for this and, 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 and helped us put it together. Kind of the idea was born uh, last, or earlier this year. Um, John, our worship pastor, came and knocked on my door, and he goes, hey, I got an idea, and it might be Holy Spirit inspired. And I said, lay it on me. And uh, there you get Charlie Brown. So um, that all came from that. And you know, what is God going to do with this? We don't know exactly, but what we try to do here, not just with that, but in all things, is if he truly is the potter and we are the clay, then he'll make out of it what he wants, right? And so that's kind of our attitude towards it. So I just want to say thank you for all your help with that and praying for it and supporting it. Really appreciate it. Hey, if you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. That's where we're going to be today, 2 Chronicles 26. And while you're turning there, let me just uh, thank you for sticking with this series. We are in the final message of our Too Much series, which has been a financial series. And I, I guess that I want to thank you for sticking with it, because let's face it, when you already know ahead of time that the preacher is going to talk about money, let's be honest, the temptation to stay home that week elevates just a little, doesn't it? I mean, it does. So, so thank you for sticking with it. Heard about a guy who was on vacation down in Acapulco, and one evening he left his hotel and was just enjoying the, the warm evening there in Mexico, and, and he heard off in the distance somebody screaming. It was like a panic. And so he ran towards this panic, and he, he rounded the corner, and he found this woman who was, who was screaming and crying over her child who was laying on, on the, the ground. And this, 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 this man, he knew enough Spanish to discern that the kid was choking and not breathing. And so instinctively, this man just picked up the kid by the ankles and gave him three big shakes. <clears throat> and on the third shake, out popped a quarter out of the kid's mouth. And he started breathing again. So after everybody had calmed down, the, the mother just said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You seem to know just what to do to get that money out of him. She goes, are you a doctor? He goes, oh, no, I'm not a doctor. I'm a preacher. And so uh, anyway, hey, all joking aside, thank you for sticking with this series. Some of you has delayed reaction. I get it. I get it. But thank you for sticking with this series. And uh, our goal, my hope, is just that when it comes to every subject, especially this topic we've been talking about money, we just want to see it like God sees it. And wouldn't that be a true statement? Don't you want to see things the way God sees things? Don't you want to think about things the way that God thinks about them? And I hope that this series has challenged us to ask some very uh, straightforward questions, and we've answered them accordingly. Now, throughout this series so far, uh, we've been talking about, about these principles, and we learned in the very first week how Moses reminded us that God is outrageously generous towards us. The next week, we talked about Solomon, and he taught, taught us a thing or two about this myth. Do you remember what it was? The myth of more. Hey, the more stuff I can get, the happier I'm going to be, which we all know is not true. Last weekend, we learned about Abraham, and he taught us something about learning to trust God. So these first three biblical principles of gratitude, contentment, trust, well, they sound like good principles to build our lives upon, don't they? Today, we're going to look at a guy by the name of Uzziah, and I believe that his story is definitely going to speak some truth into our story as we uh, unpack this final biblical principle in this series, the principle of humility. Humility. Now let's look at verse 1 of chapter 6. So you got it in front of you? It says, Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jecoila. She was from Jerusalem. So here you have Uzziah. He's 16 years old, and all of a sudden, he's the king over all the people. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. When I was 16 years old, I would not have been ready for this role. 
Probably neither would you. But at 16, he's thrown into this role of being the king, and he had kind of a tough family history. And you think about his lineage, his, his father was the king, and his father was assassinated. His grandfather was the king, and he was the victim of a terrible conspiracy. His great-grandfather, he was the king for one year, and he was assassinated. I wonder what was going through Uzziah's mind at 16 when he became king, knowing all of that. I'm wondering, maybe in the middle of the night, is somebody going to come and, and assassinate me like, like my father, my great-grandfather? You know, did he ever think that he would reign for 52 years? Perhaps it's a good thing that his parents named him Uzziah. Do you know what Uzziah means? Uzziah means God is my strength. So every time somebody said to his name, hey, Uzziah, it's a reminder, God is my strength. Maybe that has something to do with what we read next. Look at verse 4. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who insisted, or instructed him, rather, in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. I want you to notice one thing in these two verses. It says, he sought. He sought. What did he seek? He sought the Lord. It was an intentional endeavor. He didn't accidentally stumble upon it. No, he sought the Lord. Now look at the next verse. The next few verses reads a lot like a resume would. Look at verse 6. He went to war against the Philistines, and he broke down the walls of Gath, Jabna, and Ashdod. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and ever, elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gerbel and against the Meunites. This guy had a lot of power. I mean, he had significant power. He was a very capable leader, military leader as well. He expanded the boundaries of Israel. He defeated their enemies. Now, God was behind all the success, but this guy had a lot of power. Look at verse 8. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah, and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he had become very powerful. So this power gave him an incredible reputation. There were countries that were paying tribute to him. Do you know what a tribute is? It is a big old thank you for not destroying us. That's, what, that's a lot of power. That's a lot of reputation. Look at verse 9. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle of the wall, and he fortified them. He also built towers in the wilderness, and he dug many cisterns, because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain. He had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. This is the guy that made a lot of improvements in that 52 years as king. Improvements to the infrastructure of the country. Agriculturally, things were going great. Trade was on the rise. This guy was all about improving. Look at verse 11. Uzziah had a well-trained army ready to go out by divisions according to their numbers as mustered by Jael and the secretary uh, and Manasseh, the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the royal officials. The total number of family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307,500 men trained for war. A powerful force to support the king against his enemies. So this guy had an army, an incredible defense to protect all of these great improvements. So a powerful army. Look at verse 14. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of honor, bows, and sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made devices invented for use on the towers and on the corner defenses so that soldiers could shoot arrows and hurl large stones from the walls. We live in a different age, don't we? We're not being called up to the city walls to shoot arrows and throw rocks at people, at least not this year. And uh, his, that's, that's a silly joke that fell flat, sorry. His fame spread far and wide. Now listen to this next part. For he was greatly helped until he became powerful. Now notice this guy developed things. He invented weapons of war and, and, and he, had, he had expanded the defenses. I mean, just think about his resume, if you will. Power. Reputation, improvements, defense, 
New technology, equipment. I mean, his resume reads so well, but his resume is not finished. And verse 15 kind of is a pivotal thing saying, uh, something's going on. He was greatly helped until, well, until what? We'll look at verse 16, we find out. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his what? Downfall. His pride led to his downfall. Here's what happened. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. This was a huge no-no. Didn't matter you're the king. That's not your role. This is a role just for the priest. There was very specific rules about who could do this. And this is where his pride led him. I am now, as the king, going to also do the role of the priest. And look at verse 17. Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests. And I, I love the word courageous in there because it was absolutely nothing short of courageous to confront the king. They, uh, they, the, he's, he's 80 priests uh, followed him into the temple. Verse 18, they confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priest, the descendants of Aaron, you have been cons- who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. That takes a lot of courage to say to the most powerful man in the land. How do you think he took it? Not good. Look at the very next verse. Uzziah had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense. He became angry while he was raging at the priest in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple. Leprosy (coughs) broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. Leprosy was a terrible skin disease we read about in the Old and New Testaments. So they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. Verse 21. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people in the land. The other events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet Isaiah. Uzziah rested with his ancestors and was buried near them in a cemetery that belonged to the kings. For the people said he had leprosy. (coughs) And Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king. What's the key verse in this passage? His pride led to his downfall. As this powerful king, this accomplished king, he wanted to do the work of the priest. And that was the final straw. His pride had gone too far. And right there as he is raging, he's probably throwing stuff, he's angry at these priests for trying to stop him. And leprosy breaks out all over his head. These priests could not stop him. How do you stop the king from doing what he wants to do? Who stopped him? God stopped him. And this wasn't some um, form of leprosy that just started. No, no, no. This was a supernatural affliction that God sent to him and leprosy spread all over his forehead and then he was was rushed out of there. He was put into quarantine, which is what happened with people with leprosy. They were quarantined from the people. He had moved from the limelight to being all alone. He moved from the palace to a place apart from the people for the rest of of his life. And Uzziah, he didn't just move out of the palace. He moved from a place of honor and achievement away from all of that, even up to the point of his death. He moved from honor to humiliation. And did you catch the subtle language in the Bible? It says he was buried near his father's. So in other words, he didn't even get the honor of being buried with the other kings. Because he had leprosy and was so dishonored, he was quarantined even in his death. And at the end of his life, he's not remembered for all of his great achievements. What did they say at the end of his life? He had leprosy. He's known as the leprous king. 
You know, Dr. Scott Fallman is probably not a name that any of you are familiar with, but he is somebody who has dedicated his entire professional career to um, uh, advancing AI, or also known as artificial intelligence. That was where, that was his specialty. And he worked for 40 years at Pittsburgh's Carnegie Mellon University, and that was his whole life's work, <coughs> advanced artificial technology. Recently, he said, I will never be remembered for my contributions in artificial technology. I'll never be remembered for that. He says, but I will be remembered for the guy that invented emojis. You know what emojis are? You know all those little things, those smiley faces and all these little things? It actually, the, the technical name is emoticons. He is known. You can look up his name. He is known as the man being credited for the very first person to utilize the smiley face. And now, you kids won't understand this, but us old people will. All right, back in the day, before all the emojis we have today, you actually had to do, uh, at the end of something, if you thought it was funny, colon, dash, parenthesis. And that's a sideways smiley face. It's an emoticon. And then if you wanted to be sad, you'd put the, the, the other parentheses, so, and it would be kind of typed out like that. And, and he had, there's a picture online of the memo he sent to his staff years ago saying, hey, we need to be clearer when we're funny and when we're not, so if you're being funny, do this at the end. And he's, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. And uh, <laughs> Jennifer, that's really funny, isn't it? No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, and so he, he, he said, my obituary will shout, he invented the smiley face. And I think about that, and I think about Uzziah. Uzziah is not remembered for his great military achievements. He's not remembered for the advancement of Israel's borders or their agricultural developments or any of those things. He was the leprous king, buried in dishonor. What moved him there? Pride. That, it's that simple. That's what moved him there, pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, Pride be goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. There's a phrase that we say, maybe you've said it before, hey, what goes around comes around. You ever said that? Maybe that's something we should remember when talking about pride, particularly when it comes to money and the things that money can buy. What was it that brought Uzziah down? Well, it was the same things that can bring us down, things that can go to our head and, and make us feel like we're more important or bigger than what we actually are. What puffs us up can also bring us down. It's the very same thing. So what are some things in this world that tend to puff us up, to make us feel maybe more important than we are, maybe pushes us down the road of pride farther than it should? Let me ask you this. Do you have a position of power or authority at work or in a particular organization, maybe within your family or within your extended family or even in your neighborhood? Do, does that power... Does that make you feel good, that authority, especially when you use it? How about your reputation? What are you known for? Are you a popular person? Are you followed on Twitter by, by many, many people? When you put something on Facebook, do you get hundreds of likes? Is your name in a program? Do you find yourself on a team roster? Are you listed as an officer in an organization? When your name is mentioned, do people think about how talented you are or how wealthy you are or how influential you are? Have you made some improvements to yourself? Have you improved your physique, your look lately? How about at your house? Have you made improvements there? Have you improved your knowledge base or your skill level? Have you added some initials before or after your name lately? You got more certificates on your wall than you used to? How about how defensive do you get? When somebody corrects you or even offers constructive, constructive criticism, do you find yourself defending yourself at all costs? Like you're never in a position where you might say, you might have a point or you might be right or, or no, you're wrong on that. Have you ever said, I, I'm wrong? You know, studies have concluded that the three um, the three hardest words to say in this world are not, I love you. Some people think that's the hardest three words to say. It's not that. The hardest three words to say is, I don't know. 
I don't know. Because who ever wants to be in a position of I don't know? Or we don't want to ad admit our lack of knowledge or that we have made mistakes. You know, I tell you, the, the one thing, pride, is what gets in the way more than anything, I think, of somebody coming to know Jesus. Because in pride, it keeps you from humbling yourself before God, saying, I need you. Pride says, I don't need anybody but me. Are you enjoying some new wheels, some new equipment? How about new square footage on your home? How about a new wardrobe in your closet? New piece of technology hanging off your hip? All of these things that can play into puffing us up are the very same things that could tear us down. If we're not careful, we might be inviting a very unwelcome fall in our life. Many of you would probably be familiar with the name Nick Walenda. Um, he is very famous for his acrobatics. Most specifically, he is a tightrope walker. Do you know who Nick Walenda is? He's probably most well known because he walked a tightrope across Niagara Falls. Anybody watch that live on TV? He also did the same thing over the Grand Canyon. And I remember when he did the live special over the Grand Canyon, my boys and I and my wife were all in the room, and I had the remote, and this is how I had to watch that. I had to, to watch it, and then I had to flash to like Sports Center or something like that, because I couldn't stand it. And then I would flash back, yep, he's still alive. And then I'd flash back over to the other channel. A minute later, I'd flash back, he's still on the tightrope, he's still living. We flash back. I was too nervous. I couldn't watch it. What people, a lot of people don't realize too about Nick Walenda is my understanding is that he is also a follower of Jesus. And he understands something about himself. There's an awareness there that his friends talk about. This is, a, this is Nick's normal practice that his friends say. That uh, after he does one of these you know, uh, shows, and there's thousands of people that come watch him walk these tightropes, after the crowd goes home, and after... After the TV crews are gone, he's done signing autographs and giving interviews, they said, we'll often find Nick where the crowd used to stand, and he's picking up trash. So he went from like the spotlight to cleaning up after people who came to watch him. And when asked, like, why does he do this? Nick will say he understands that there are some falls that are worse than others. He understands that all the attention can lead to some bad places. And to help him rem remember what it's all about, he goes out and picks up trash out from the people that came to watch him perform. Some falls are worse than others. There, there's a movement there that is it's moving towards humility. And I wonder, can we say the same things? Do we find ourselves moving towards or gravitating towards humility? That's exactly what Jesus did. You still got your Bibles open? Can you flip over to the New Testament, to the book of Philippians, and look in chapter 2? I want to show you something there that Paul wrote about Jesus. He was teaching the church about having the same mentality, the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And this mindset is very obvious that Jesus often moved towards humility. Now look at verse uh, 5. It says this, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Right? That's, that's what Paul's telling the church. Get in the same frame of mind as Jesus. Now what is that exactly? Verse 6 you know, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, <clears throat> that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself. He moved towards humility. How, what, what did that look like? Well, he, Jesus, the creator of life, born as a helpless infant, confined to a human body, laid in a feeding trough known as a manger where animals ate out of. Is there a more humbling journey that you can think of? 
to go from the presence of God himself to a lowly manger? Jesus, the Son of God, is like he stooped out of heaven to wash his disciples' feet. The most humbling job you could think of at the time. Before dying on a criminal's cross, he washed those dirty feet. As an example. Here he was, an innocent man who, who never sinned, and he willingly took the sins of the world, your sin, my sins, onto that cross. And he, he suffered a humiliating death by crucifixion. Time and time again, we see Jesus move towards humility before God. I wonder, why did Paul want to bring that out? Why did he want the church to, to gravitate towards Jesus and have such a deep um, appreciation for what he'd done? Was it because Paul wanted us to know something theological about the Lord? No. It was so that we would live more intentionally like him. So Paul's saying, this is what Jesus did. And as a church, move towards that, have the same mindset, share the same mentality as Jesus. And what had prompted Paul to even bring Jesus into that part of the conversation? Why is Paul challenging him? Look back two verses. You got Philippians still? Look at verse 3. Paul said this to the church. He's teaching them. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In other words, don't be selfish. Rather, in, here's this word, humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of of others like Jesus did. You know what, church? Have the same mindset as Jesus because that's what, that's what he did. Now, now you think, did Jesus invite us to learn from him because he had advanced degrees and, and all kinds of certificates hanging on his wall? Absolutely not. Did he invite us to learn from him and be like him because he was in high demand as a speaker or because he was a miracle worker? No, 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 no. Jesus invited us to learn from him because of this. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and, and what? Learn from me. You come follow me, you come with me, you walk with me, and you learn with me. And then he says, For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus, I want you to learn from me because I am gentle and I am humble. I think we'd be honest, humility is probably one of, if not the hardest lesson to learn as a Christ follower. Humility. Yet if we claim to be followers of Jesus, then we're commanded to walk as Jesus walked, to have the same mindset as Christ. And if we're going to learn from a humble Jesus, some things, then, then what are we to learn? That he was humble, he was gentle, we must be the same way in humility. Now let me say a word about humility, because I don't want you to be confused. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves. That's not what humility is. Humility is thinking less often about ourselves. Humility is not something that's done to us, that is humiliation. But we move to a place of humil humility. We move towards a lower position. We move to a place where we're not clinging to status or what other people think about us. You know, I think as I evaluate our culture, the world we live in, and I think, how do, what do we place value on? And how do we identify? What, what is it that makes somebody who they are? How does the world see this thing? Well, I, I, I think you could look at it like this. We, we kind of have a triple A identity. There's three words that all start with A, and they identify who people are in, in the world's mind. People will say, we're going to look at your achievements, and we're going to take a look at your address, and we're going to take a peek at your assets. Those three things together is how people identify themselves today. When you meet somebody for the first time, what are some normal questions that we ask? Hey, what do you do? Hey, where do you live? Hopefully we have a, a good enough filter in place we don't ask, hey, what do you get paid? <laughs> you know, I hope we have a good enough filter in place. 
But that's how people self-identify. That's what that many people say brings worth. It, it comes down to my achievements, my address, and my assets. Our identity communicates something about our assets. Like most people would say, you know, well, the car they drive or the clothes they wear, the jewelry they buy, the hobbies they do, the trips they take, on and on and on. It's all focused on those things. But can I argue something about uh, for the church today and for us as followers of Christ who are trying to have the same mindset as Jesus? Why not abandon the cultural norms and say, my identity and what I'm about has nothing to do with my achievements or my address or my assets? And it has everything to do with being a part of this, a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. Could we move towards humility and identify that way? I don't identify with these things. I identify with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, and I am so thankful that I am in Him and He loves me and I'm going to heaven one day and that's what's really important. A couple years ago, Denzel Washington, uh, the famous actor, you know, he gave a commencement speech at Dillard University in Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana. And he shocked everybody when he told all these graduates that what they need to do is they pretty much just need to humble yourself before God and thank Him for everything. And everybody was like, say what? Here's a quote from his speech. Denzel Washington said, put God first in everything you do. Everything I have is by the grace of God. Understand that. It's a gift. I didn't always stick with him, but he stuck with me. While on your knees, say thank you. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for parents. Thank you for love. Thank you for kindness. Thank you for humility. Thank you for peace. Thank you for prosperity. Say thank you. I don't know a thing about Denzel Washington's faith. I don't know if he has one, really. Um, but this may shock you. I don't know Denzel personally. He's not on my speed dial. I know it's a shocker. I don't know anything about Denzel Washington, honestly. But I do like what he said. I do think he's on the right track there. And I wonder, could Hollywood famous Denzel Washington... Could he be on a move, not towards pride, but towards humility? I think it's a move that every single one of us should make every single day that we have air in our lungs. We're going to move towards humility, moving more like Christ, sharing his mindset, identifying ourselves not as the world does, but as God does. A holy people, a people belonging to God. I'm in the Lord's family, putting others first, following in his footsteps. It's not about what I can get. It's about what God can do through me, through generosity, all of those things. Humility. Can I pray for you?